Hi everyone, Sal Khan here. Welcome to the Homeroom live stream. We have a very exciting guest today. We're going to have John Dickerson, who is uh, works for uh, 60 Minutes, a CBS contributing analyst, uh, contributes to The Atlantic, and also has written The Hardest Job in the World. So a lot to talk about, especially with the election coming up and kind of our government and the history of the United States. So if you have any questions about that, feel free to start putting them in the message boards wherever you are watching this, and our team members are going to surface it to myself and John. But before we jump into that very exciting conversation, I'll give my standard reminders. First of all, a reminder that Khan Academy is a not-for-profit organization, uh, and we can only do what we do uh, with philanthropic support from folks like yourself. So if you're in a position to do so, please think about going to khanacademy.org slash donate and making a donation. I also want to give a special shout out to several organizations that have stepped up during COVID when they realized that we were already running a deficit before COVID and that deficit only grew as we had to have higher server costs and accelerate a whole bunch of programs. So special thanks to Bank of America, Google.org, AT&T, Fastly Novartis, and the many, many, many other supporters that have supported Khan Academy through the years, and especially all of y'all who have continued to support us through COVID. It's the only way we can do what we do. And the last announcement, just reminding everyone that you can get a version of this live stream in podcast format, uh, wherever you get your podcasts, Homeroom with Sal, the podcast. So with that, I'm excited to introduce John Dickerson, 60 Minutes correspondent, CBS contributing analyst. You contribute to The Atlantic. You do a lot of things. I mean, any one of the things I just mentioned would be more than a full-time job. <laughs> but good to see you, John. It's great to be with you again, Sal. So maybe a good place to start. I have a ton of questions, but obviously we're days away from an election. You know, every election, I think, always feels special and different, but this one feels more different than normal. Obviously, it's happening in, in very unusual circumstances. How are you thinking about it? Well, I think um, you're right. There's so the most the reason the basic reason it feels different is that we are holding or trying to hold an election in the in the time of a pandemic so that every vote cast and counted is um under different scrutiny St some states have had to create entirely new ways of voting um so that would be just be the basic big challenge of the moment we're in we are also in a highly contentious moment in which the president who is usually the guardian and steward of that system which is the bedrock of the american system which is a a form for voting that allows the peaceful transfer of power or the peaceful maintenance of power. It's basically the first block in the building block of American government. The president has been questioning, challenging, poking, prodding at that basic brick in the, in the structure of America by questioning whether the votes will be, um, will be honest, whether the vote counting and the way it's being done uh, is uh, somehow going to throw the result into question. So you have the voting in a pandemic, and then you have the basically the most popular, well-known figure in American politics calling that into question. So those are just two things. And then, of course, you have a series of issues that are at the center of the election, which are major and big and need to be addressed. Pandemic is one. The economic situation in America is, other, is the other. And then the ongoing racial um, uh, debate, questions, protests about equality in America and whether that is uh, broadly shared or broadly available to, and particularly to black Americans. And how do you think, I know predicting the future is always a, a hard thing to do, but let's, let's try a little bit. How do you think it's going to play out? I'm mean, given everything you just talked about, uh, you know, on election day, this isn't going to be a typical election day where by midnight or 1 AM people are going to say, Oh, it looks like, you know, so-and-so is the next president. Right. Here's what I'm looking for in terms of the way it plays out. The one thing to watch is right now the, the early vote that's taking place both, both in person and by mail. Um, there are some states like Florida and Arizona that start the counting early. Um, and those are states that we should all kind of look to on election night. Um, I've become particularly interested in Arizona. They start counting two weeks before. They've been voting early since 1996, so they're pretty good at doing it. About 90% of the vote will be counted before uh, election day in Arizona, which means you're going to have durable, a durable counting process there. Um, and uh, so we're going to, so we have the early vote going on. Then we look at the states that are able to process those votes so that we'll get an answer on election night. 
Then we've got to look at the votes that are being cast on election day. And one of the splits people should look for is that a lot of Democrats are voting early. It's likely that the bulk of the Republican vote will be on election day. So we should all be prepared for some numbers that come in that show uh, perhaps Joe Biden winning because of the early vote, but then maybe change once, once some states start to count their in-person vote during the day. And we should all be ready and prepared if it's a close election for the election to be determined maybe into the next day after election day, or maybe even some days down beyond that. On the other hand, early in the evening, we'll get results from some East Coast states, Florida, North Carolina, in particular, Georgia, that will tell us something about the way the night is trending. And it could be, even though everybody is prepared for a long election week, it could be that we get a signal early in the night from some of those states that it's going to go one way uh, because the turnout is just, you know, uh, been for one candidate or another, and we could get an early result. So everybody's preparing for a long counting process, but that doesn't mean that's the only kind of answer we might get once the votes start being counted. And I just want to make sure I understand the logistics or, or how the information gets out as we approach election day. So even a place like Arizona where they start the counting ahead of time, do they release that information as they have it? Is that where we see like, you know, the, the precincts reporting and all that? How, how does that get out there? This is my favorite fact about Arizona at the moment. The counting is going on and it is in a computer somewhere. The tabulation, so what they do is they, they open the ballot, they check the, the, the um, information on the ballot against the voter file, they check the signatures, they make sure it's an, a, uh, an actual valid ballot, and then they tabulate it. Those tabulations are sitting in a computer and will sit in a computer until election day. It's not hooked up to the internet. It is, in, it is a number inside the computer that nobody knows. Then once the polls close in Arizona election day, they will release that tabulation. So that's the tabulation of the early mail and in-person vote. And so you'll get a big kind of gurgle of results. And then slowly over time, they will add in the votes on election day and so those, the votes by machine on election day, but then also some people will drop off their ballots on election day, which means that they've gotten an early ballot and then it will have to be assessed. They'll compare the signatures, they'll compare it to the voter roll. And so that'll take a little bit of time. Arizona, even though they have a time-tested, well-stressed um, vote by mail process, they've had some elections recently where the result on election night has been different than the result several days later because of that because of that counting process. Now that's just in Arizona. Every state has a different process. It's why some of the states people are most fascinated by, um, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, those are three states that Donald Trump won in 2016, which was a part of his surprise upset victory. Those are, I call them the headache states because Pennsylvania doesn't start processing ballots until election day. So it, they, their process is kind of slow and it may mean that we don't get a result if those states are close you may not get a result for a few days and there will be lots of things to bicker over in the way that they count their um, their ballots. So every state does it differently, some better than others. And a lot of questions are coming in related to what you just talked about from YouTube. Mark R. Thompson says, why can't all states do what Arizona is doing? <laughs> well, uh, we may find that, um, that they may all start to try and do that. Um, the principle has been that um, local control, you know, in the United States where um, this is uh, best handled by people closest to the ones doing the actual voting. And the upside also of it is when we think about hacking and disruption from foreign uh, adversaries or anybody who would try to seize power in America from a local perspective, very hard to do when you have uh, many, many different kinds of voting systems. Um, and so in a way, uh, the inefficiency of having so many different systems has a slight benefit in that it's harder to disrupt because you'd have to learn how to disrupt each little play, each little county sometimes. And in some states, the rules are different by county. Um, so there's, a, there's a, a way in which the inefficiency actually protects us a little bit. But, and I should just add, they, we have tried as a, as a country to reform our voting process during the Car Ford administration, Carter administration, Obama administration, and they are big binders full of analysis on how to make voting easier and better. And it never quite happens uh, for a variety of reasons, in part because the federal government can't tell the states what to do. But maybe after the, the embarrassing uh, delays and confusion here, there might be, um, maybe there will be a new push 
to uh, to improve things. I like that point. That was the first time I heard kind of our fragmentation of our of our voting system as a feature and not a bug. Uh, but it, it does make sense. It does make it harder to game because you have to little game it at a at least at a state level, probably at a local level. And that goes into another question. You know, you 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 alluded to the fact that Donald Trump has said a few times that he's skeptical of uh, some of the mail in early voting that maybe there, you know, the election might be called into question from YouTube. Mr. Spector is asking, will it be a fair election? How will they make sure the votes are fair and nothing is rigged? Well, each of the individual states and the secretaries of states in the states will, uh, has a process for doing that. Um, part, one thing people should really keep in mind is that a lot of these states and particularly ones that have had close elections have a time tested and honored way of figuring out whether there's any fraud. The reason there is so little fraud is it's really hard to do. And when they have found fraud on election day or through voting, it's been found out. So um, it might take a little while um, in some states because they have a kind of multi-level process to make sure that the voting that's taking place um, is honorable and true. But the length of time that it's taking means that they are doing their, their work. They are checking their, um, you know, they're doing their math again. They're not rushing through the process. And so delay, and um, it might be a little irritating in this, in this world where we would all like everything instantaneously, but it is the sign of, of diligent work going forward that is actually going to protect the durability of the vote. So what we can rely on is the systems within the states. Um, and the fact that everybody's been worried about what voting in a, in a pandemic is going to be like. And so there are a lot of people who are watching. Um, and, and while some states have had rigorous debates over the number of polling places and the number of drop-off spots for early ballots, there are a lot of people paying attention. Um, and so it's a little bit harder to do a sleight of hand or some kind of fraud with so many eyes on uh, what's taking place. And, you know, one thing that you, you brought up and that, you know, you, you talking about that gives me confidence um, in, in what is happening. But even in your kind of, it sounds like almost not worst case, but not great scenarios, you have it maybe a few days past election day. You know, I was hearing these scenarios that I haven't heard them as much recently where people say it might take weeks and it might be disputed and it might go, you know, depending on, on how it's disputed. If some states don't want to, you know, say that they have a final tally, that it could go to the state legislatures. I've been hearing all of these other kind of Byzantine worst case scenarios. Do you think any of those are happening or is that just kind of scaremongering of like an absolute disaster scenario? Well, it's a, it's a good question. I could cook up some truly awful scenarios. Um, I mean, basically the closer it is, the more, um, tricky it might get because, A, if it's close, it means that um, every tiny little vote really could matter. Remember what happened in 2000 in Florida. You had um, a committee of people obsessing about the tiny pieces of paper that hung from the punch ballots, the chads, as you'll remember, um, which really showed how you can funnel the entire intensity of the American political system and the power that is exchanged in elections down to a tiny piece of paper that is basically barely bigger than the head of a pencil. So it can get really weird really fast. And um, if it's not close, however, then, then there might be some sloppiness. There always is in an election. It's a massive undertaking. We might have you know, between 150 and 160 million people in America. It is not something that ever goes off with 100% purity. Um, just because of human activity at that scale has bumps and messiness and 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 a, an occasional untucked shirt tail but if it's so but if it's not close a little messiness can be accommodated by the overwhelming result for one of the two candidates um and i think that it, so basically i've tried not to sketch the, the the total disaster scenarios because while people are prepared for them and everybody should be emotionally prepared for complexity um i also think that if we get too uh, up on tiptoe and get to um, talk too much about how awful it all could be, it sets the stage for mischief makers, who some of whom are domestic, some of whom are, are from our adversaries, who um, in a highly heightened atmosphere can throw in just a little disinformation. And if everybody's already so keyed up 
that little bit of information will cause people to go pinballing all over the place. Um, and so one of our jobs uh, in the press is to try to keep the eye on the ball, what's the most important thing, um, and not go through a kind of doom scrolling of all the possible awful things that might happen. Um, and, and in fact, teach people or remind people that, you know, this is going to be a developing story on election night and, and to, to ignore rumors and to practice some restraint in handling the incoming information um, because, you know, it, it might take a slightly winding path and don't mistake the natural windiness of the election counting process for anything having gone wrong. Um, if they do that, there will be less chaos uh, on election day. And you're, you're touching on actually the next question that has come through on this notion of foreign influence, mischief makers, polarization from Facebook. John Lavelle asks, the foreign influence that has taken place in our country has fueled the division that threatens the union and has been very successful. The two tribes are at each other's throat. The question is, who has helped widen the gap? And I'll expand that a little bit. I, I do sometimes wonder how successful have the foreign influence actually been? It seems like there's evidence that it's been going on, but how successful has it been? Or has it been more of our own making through uh, polarization through social media or even the media itself changing and, and kind of polarizing? Well, the answer to that question is yes, <laughs> which is to say that certainly we had foreign adversaries who were trying through a variety of different methods, um, Facebook groups, phony ads, um, attempts at voter suppression, to tinker with American politics. But I think one of the most potentially powerful things they did was in a nation uh, where political combat is so corrosive among the highly online and the highly engaged, which is not the majority of our country, and it's not even the majority of voters, but nevertheless, it, it does represent a lot of people on social media who, who can affect news coverage, who can affect the, the culture in which voting takes place, that's where when you throw disinformation into the middle of that kind of swarm, where we're already bickering and short-tempered and questioning motives in our political debate, it, 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 has, a, um, it has an explosive effect. So it's not, it, it, in some cases, it's not even um, misinformation. It's just um, the coarsest possible information, which then causes a reaction and a counter reaction from each side. So um, the, 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 the partisanship in America among political obsessives has gotten much, much worse, um, both in the way they think about the parties and the way in which they think about the opposite members of the parties. You know about the polling that long ago, people who were political obsessives would be okay with one of their offspring marrying somebody of the other party. Yeah. Now that number is down. It might be in the teens of political obsessives who would be all right with one of their offspring marrying a member of the other party. Those are the political obsessives. There's also a lot of work be, that's done on, on voters that finds that basically about 80% of the voters are not obsessed and thinking the absolute worst of, of the other party. Now, they can get there pretty fast if you if you get into a conversation with them and you misbehave and you um, and you treat them as um, you know subhuman because of the party they belong to, but mostly the people who spend a lot of time on social media and the people who are who represent the worst in our political dialogue are actually a relatively small percentage of the electorate, the electorate, and, and an even smaller percentage of the American people. And. You, you know, we, this polarization, where do you think it's going to lead to? Do you think it depends on the outcome of the election? Do you think we have some just, you know, structural trends because of social media and it's not like the Russians and the Iranians and the Chinese are going to disappear overnight? I mean, is there some way that we converge back to, um, and is there any re lessons from history uh, that tell us that, okay, we can clearly, I mean, obviously we've had a civil war, uh, so things have gotten bad in the past. How, 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 how do we heal? What's it going to look like in 20 years? Yeah. Well, the Civil War the Civil War example is the most dangerous one, of course, which is that we only heal after we tear ourselves apart. Um, and so you'd hate to you hate to, you'd hate to have to see reform come out of that kind of hot stove moment um, because of the carnage that would be required to create that kind of um, wake up call for the whole country. There are. Um, I mean, I think the best case for 
getting out of our current fix um, is probably a combination of two things. One would be a, a considerable political defeat um, of one of the two parties, which would change the political incentives for the individual members in the party to not listen to the base of their party, but listen to the larger country. The problem is, and I'm going to be general here, although, um, you know, at the moment, because Donald Trump is the president, the power he holds over Republicans in his party um, is is tremendous. And, and, you know, as Jared Kushner says, this is Donald Trump's Republican Party. And so if you're a Republican member of the House or Senate, you are judged by your president and also the partisans in your party uh, by whether or not you're... Um, you support Donald Trump. Well, that's um, not really the way the founders intended it to, to, to operate. They wanted a system in which lawmakers use their reason to evaluate the questions of the day. And political affiliation and maintaining political power was what they feared. Um, but the system is where it is. So what you need is, a, is something to happen that breaks the link between individual members of a party and the group interest of that party that basically says to people, gee, just supporting my team has caused this enormous electoral loss. I should probably go back to what the people want me to care about, which is whatever it happens to be. Um, and so you sever the extreme um, adhesion between individual candidates and their parties. One of the ways you do that is, um, and that has to probably happen through an event. In other words, a massive electoral loss. It would then potentially open the door to some reforms. And what the reforms would do is they would break down the structural impediments to bipartisanship, which I won't go into, uh, but which I go to into in some length in my book, but which um, the death of split ticket voting, the fact that we all live near each other and therefore if you're a Republican, you tend to live on a block full of Republicans now in a way that you didn't in the 70s. Um, gerrymandering, all kinds of other structural um, parts of the system that, that accentuate partisanship. Um, you would need something to basically have some reforms that would break apart those structural uh, sorting techniques that have created, or I shouldn't say, they've, they've both created and locked in the partisanship we have now. Yeah, no, I mean, it's it's a fascinating thing of how it could evolve, but, but that makes a ton of sense. You know, going to your, your book, The Hardest Job in the World, you're referring to the presidency. I can think of other hard jobs too, but that one does seem hard. Um, from YouTube, Nish786 says, you make the case in The Hardest Job in the World that the demands of the American presidency have grown impossible for any one person to fulfill. What problems does that pose? And I'll add to, to Nish's question, what? how do you fix that? I mean, I guess it, it sounds like a pretty hard thing to fix. Well, and thank you for the question, and thanks for reading the book. Um, so we were talking about just some of the problems with the modern presidency, which is partisanship, um, which has locked up Congress, which means that the president no longer has a willing partner uh, or no longer has the willing partner of the kind that the, the founders wanted in Congress, um, something that, uh, that operates independently to uh, address the big challenges of the day in a way that accommodates the diversity of the country. What we have now is as Congress is, is um, less able to do its job effectively, a lot of the decision making gets thrown over onto the president's plate. And then the president has to use the weak tools of the office, which are not universally applicable to all the problems of the day, to through executive orders and other ways to try to address some of the issues that Americans care about. Well, executive orders and executive action and work through the administrative agencies is a weak way to do it. Basically, it doesn't, it doesn't get the job done. And when presidents act in ways that are um, seen as unilateral by the opposite political party, it encourages the opposite political party to be very angry. If you, if you can work things through Congress, the opposite political party at least has a voice and a structure. Now, some people would argue about that with respect to the recent Supreme Court um, uh, fights that have gone on. But nevertheless, when Congress is working as it's intended, it's, a, it's basically a structure for having arguments and for seeing who wins that argument and then at least making the losers feel like the system was fair enough so that they'll, they can live to fight another day. What you don't want in any system is where people feel like they were basically maneuvered by the structure of the system to a bad result and they really couldn't change anything. So some of the structural changes in, in Congress we've been talking about we need to change. The president 
you know, has accumulated power ever since basically the, you can put the finger down anywhere in the timeline, but let's say basically the New Deal and the Second World War. So the, that's hard power to give back and they don't want to do that. But as Americans, we can stop looking to the president every time we want a political solution. Um, and we can stop um, rewarding presidents who promise that they alone can do it, as Donald Trump promised. You need to, you need to uh, elevate presidents who operate in the American system as it should work, not as in an American system in which they are the lone superpower, sorry, the lone superhero who can, through force of their will and skill, solve all of America's problems. It's not the way the government is supposed to work, and we should stop thinking that's the way it's supposed to work, because it just leads to frustration. Yeah. Although I wonder about that. I mean, even in corporate America, we tend to have, you know, the, the CEO, we, you know, Elon Musk is sending rockets to, to, to space. Well, no, it's Elon Musk, plus a lot of other people are doing it, <laughs> you know, stuff like right. Steve Jobs created well, the app. And, well, it's the Steve Jobs and a lot of other people. Well, and but in the corporate world, at least that's there's the chance that that's more likely to happen because the CEO mm -hmm. can have, you know, absolute power if they've designed the organization that way. Even if a president wanted absolute power, they don't have it. Um, and they and and so it's 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 sort of the worst of both worlds because if we think of them as an all powerful CEO but then don't give them the tools to do the job then they both make claims like they're going to be the Elon Musk of the government but then don't have the ability to actually do it um, and you know there's the there's not really a feedback mechanism that there is in the corporate world um, basically with a the presidency there's one feedback mechanism re-election. Um, and um, most of them take intermediate feedback mechanisms if they lose a midterm or if their polls go down. But if a president has a strong enough pain threshold or a high enough pain threshold, I should say, then they can, they can you know, power through and, and face no real feedback other than, um, other than the election after four years because Congress is no longer a feedback mechanism because everything is so connected now. If you're a senator, Basically, as a Republican senator, if you're running, your voters want to know, are you for the president or against him? The rest mm -hmm. is secondary. And that's I say that for having interviewed a lot of Republican senators running. This is, I could talk to you for hours, especially given the, the, the world that we're in right now. But just in, in the last question, you know, as a member of the media uh, and, you know, the type of journalism I've followed you many years, even before we first met. And, and we've had many conversations like this, even when we're not on camera. So I have deep respect. You know, you're kind of like the journalists that I always imagined are like the people there trying to be the truth seekers and they're reading the history books and they're writing the history books. What do you, what, what advice would you have for kids out there who might be watching or people of any age? Or it's like, well, you know, we're, we're not, we're past Walter Cronkite somehow and the fourth estate of the journalism and social media has somehow ruined everything. And, you know, there isn't, you know, there's everyone's version of the truth now. So what, what advice would you have to someone who wants to become a journalist and why should they be excited about that? Well, I think that my advice would be, um, and it goes back to Khan Academy, what, you know, what is one of the great things about what you've created is, uh, it is to allow people who are curious to, to learn and to follow that curiosity and to, in the process of following that curiosity, develop the school, the skills for understanding their world. So critical thinking. Um, um, and, and curiosity and critical thinking are necessary to live a meaningful life, I think. It turns out also that they're what should fuel you as a journalist. Um, and so one of, the, one of the things I think, whether you're interested in journalism or not, um, seeking out your own answers, following your own curiosity, not just what happened, but why it happened um, for yourself, not because you're skeptical and you think everybody's trying to lie to you, but because you know that when you investigate the why of things, when you go look it up on your own, when you follow your own path of your curiosity, it's rewarding. And you gain, in a, in a democratic system, you gain control over the world around you by understanding what's happening. Events don't come plopping on you. You understand what's happening, and so you feel some control in a frantic world where, where things can seem um, out of control. And so, what I would say is anybody who is curious and a critical thinker can then go get a job where you have a license to be curious and hopefully use those critical thinking skills to, um, to follow your curiosity. The final thing I would say is for anybody who wants to become a journalist or anyone who wants to engage in journalism, just like if they're, if they're learning through Khan Academy or any other learning process, 
experimentation and understanding is not a straight line. There are things that we once believed about the movement of the planets in the heavens that we've now changed our thinking about. Einstein was a genius who saw ahead of entire generations of thinkers, but he also got a lot wrong. And he, when he found out he had gotten something wrong, he didn't feel glum about it. He was delighted because it meant that he now knew the right answer. He now could pursue a whole new set of curiosities. And I think as consumers of journalism and of any information is to understand that being wrong is not always the product of somebody who has ill intent or somebody who is acting in bad faith. There are plenty of those people to be sure. But if we understand that the pursuit of knowledge is sometimes a crooked path, then we won't get all undone every time we learn something that we thought might not be true the day before. When we Accumulation of knowledge is a kind of crooked path, and we need to know that, and we need to know that about our journalism. In its best form, it's self-correcting. The more you learn, the more you learn, and the better informed you are. But we should make sure we think of it in that way and don't always think, oh, well, you know, they said it was going to be this way and it turned out to be that way. And therefore, everything they always say is without merit. That's not true in life, and we shouldn't think about it when we, when it's not true in the way we receive our information. A little more um, understanding of the way we receive our information will help us to be better informed. No, I love that. And that seems applicable to journalism, the media, and life, to just be constantly truth-seeking and not tying your identity or ego to a certain set current fact base and always be open to, to new ideas. So John, thank you so much. This was a real treat, especially given the timing. Hopefully we can debrief and see uh, how, how, how correct your prognostications were in a, in a couple of weeks or months. <laughs> well, I, will, I would love to do it. And it's always a pleasure to be with you. So um, thanks for giving me the opportunity. Thank you, John. See you, Sal. So thanks, everyone, for for, for, for joining. Uh, always a fun conversation. You know, John really is one of those journalists. Uh, you know, I've had the pleasure of getting to have kind of just random conversations with them that go a lot like the conversation we just had. But he definitely gives you a, a spark of curiosity around, you know, the, the, the messiness, but also the beauty of what makes a society a society, what makes a government a government. Um, and, and I really do think he's, he's, you know, that, that form of journalism that, uh, we need a lot more of <laughs> more, more than ever. Uh, but just as a reminder for tomorrow, another really great guest, we're going to have Vivek Murthy, former surgeon general, and we're going to talk about, you imagine uh, a lot of things, healthcare, what's going on with COVID, um, and you know, probably a little bit of, uh, you know, what the Surgeon General does and the role of government and all of this as well. So I uh, look forward to having that conversation. So please join us tomorrow with uh, uh, on the homeroom, same time. I'll talk to y'all later.